And now tonight, we are in Exodus, so would you get there? Exodus chapter 10. Exodus 10, make sure I'm not in critical condition. Okay, Exodus chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. We, go, we come now to the eighth plague. Um, we're actually already through seven, but we're going to slow it down a little bit because I, I feel like we're going too fast. So, then, the, we're just joking. <laughs> Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and they said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land, so that no one will be able to see the land. They'll also eat the rest of what, was, what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. And then your houses shall be filled, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. And he turned and he went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said to Pharaoh, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men, the Jews, go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? Moses said, We shall go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks, and our herds, and we shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. And he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you if I ever let you go, and your little ones go, take heed, for evil is in your mind. Not so. Go now. The men among you, you want to go, just take the men. Serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat of every plant of the land, even all that is, the hail is left. So Moses stretched forth his hand over the land of Egypt and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and they settled in all the territory of Egypt they were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. For they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened. And they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees uh, that the hail had left. Thus nothing green was left on the tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. Make supplication to the Lord your God, and he would remove this death from us. And he went out from Pharaoh, and he made supplication to the Lord. Moses did. So the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts, drove them into the Red Sea, not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Lord, it just reads like a broken record as you give opportunity and opportunity and opportunity and invitation, and you say it's not going to happen until tomorrow, and, they, and yet it, 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 we know how it ends, Lord. It just seems so repetitive, and we wonder how could anybody be so stubborn and then it's, it just becomes real to us that it's us, Lord. That you give us opportunity and opportunity and, and we don't really repent. We go through the motions sometimes when things get hard. But Lord, we want to learn and understand and glean from what you have written here, truths that we can apply to our lives right now tonight. 
and to our lives to prepare us for the week ahead. So come and open our hearts, open our, our minds to receive what you have to say to your church. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Put in the words, uh, if you had prerogative and power for letter A, if you're taking notes. I'm going to see a number of principles in the text, and tonight I want you to hear in the verses 1 and 2, see what I'm going to call man's prerogative and God's power on display, because God explains why he is doing what he's doing, what his goal is. Uh, take a look at verse 1 again. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, but I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants in order that I may perform these signs among them. People struggle with this part of the Bible because it speaks of God hardening, God, uh, hardening Pharaoh's heart, and they feel like that's just not fair. God's going to judge somebody, but he's the one who hardened the guy's heart, and then he judges him for it. How can that be just, you know? It's kind of the issue that Paul brings up in Romans chapter 9. Since God's God and he chooses who he chooses, how can he still find fault for who resists his will? Paul says it's not really fair, it's not uh, just. You know, I, I hope you don't struggle with those issues. I really do. I, I, logically, you'll forever struggle with that until you realize, God, I, I don't struggle with your justice. I struggle with your mercy. Why in the world would you choose me to be, have your mercy? I don't get it. We don't, when I pray in the mornings and I say, Lord, I thank you, the first thing I thank God for is my salvation. And the first part of my salvation that I thank him for is his predestination. And if you say, well, do you believe in predestination? I hope you do. It's in your Bible. Ephesians 1, 5, Romans 8, 29. It's all through the scriptures. The Bible teaches predestination. Now, this doesn't mean I understand it completely. I know enough to know that it meant he chose me before I was in existence. I also know he chose me not because of anything uniquely about myself, because the Bible says, in love, he predestined me, not because he liked what I was going to become, but because he set his love on me without any reason other than his sovereign desire to be merciful to somebody who needed it. But when I thank God every morning for his predestination, he chose me, I, I revel in that. Got it. I, I had nothing to do with that. I, did, I didn't do anything to earn that. I, uh, why me? That's what you should be saying. Not why, why not them or why. Don't struggle with God's justice. God is just. He's more than just. He's merciful. He's merciful to people that don't deserve it, you see. But uh, here we have this statement in verse 1 where God says, I have hardened uh, Pharaoh's heart. So put this down. See, God will finally confirm people in their own choice. Uh, there are two words that are used for hardening here in our uh, book of Exodus. In, in the last verse of the previous chapter, it says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But that's a word that speaks of him hardening his own heart. And in the Hebrew, it means to resist and to harden yourself in rebellion. God's telling you to do something, I'm not going to do it. I, I don't have to. I won't do it, you know. Uh, but here, it's a different Hebrew word that means to make stiff. When God hardened his heart, it means to make stiff or to make firm. J. Vernon McGee says it's, it's kind of like this. When God hardens someone's heart, it's like he, he's, he's twisting something, and, and what comes out of it is what was in it. So God is hardening his heart just to show what is actually in it. He's not creating the original problem, you might say. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, either people on this earth will say to God, thy will be done, or eventually God will say to them, thy will be done. It's going to be one or the other. D.L. Moody said, all those who are in heaven are the whosoever wills, all those who are in hell are the whosoever won'ts. Ultimately, that's true. God's not willing that any would perish, and he's never predestined anybody to hell other than the devil and his angels. No, if someone goes to hell, it's because they've chosen to, and they've resisted everything that God has done to make a way for them. Put this down. Tell your kids and your grandkids what God did for you. If you want to take an application home, please, if you haven't already done this, you'll know if you haven't just a moment, uh, 
Make this an application. I'm making this one of my applications uh, from my own message. Tell your kids and your grandkids what God did for you. Look at verse 2. He says, God says, I'm doing these miracles that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my, my signs among them that you may know that I am the Lord. Jot down Isaiah 64 and verse 3. This was in my devotionals the other day. I just circled it because I just thought this was so, such a great verse. And the first part of it is what I want you to see. Speaking of God, he says, when you did awesome things which we did not expect. Now, I just want you to think about that for a minute. I pray that's a, a testimony you have. That you can say, Lord, I praise you for those times you did things I just, I did not expect. I just want you to, for a moment, think about your own life. Do, do any of you have the ability to say, God, you did things I, I just would have never expected you to do that? Do you, anybody else? Well, I pray it's every person in this room, and I'll bet if you think about it, you'll find that it's you as well. When God, um, out of the blue, uh, on my way to school, on my way to, I was in seminary, but on my way to school, I was sitting in an intersection and uh, waiting for the light to change, and at that moment, God put in a memory in my head of a young lady I met three or four years before for 10 minutes. I wasn't interested in dating her. She was just a girl that I was, I was involved with the teaching in the college ministry, and she looked like she was college age, and I'm supposed to be the, the net to keep all the college kids from walking out the door after service and get them to come to church, to the Sunday, you know, the, the college group. And so she looked like she was college age, so I met her and said, hey, you know, we're doing college group. And I, it was real clear she wasn't coming, but I, I, I learned a couple of things. I learned her name and that she was, uh, I think, at Cal State Fullerton and uh, worked at the library in Placentia. And I'm sitting right at the intersection of, of Chapman and Kramer, which if you know Placentia, you know the police department is there. I would later work there, but I wasn't working there. And the library is right there. And as I'm sitting there at the light on my way to seminary, this memory came into my head. Becky Olson, <laughs> library. It was the oddest thing. I wasn't like, I'm, I need a date for Friday night. It wasn't like I was thinking about girls or anything. I wasn't. So I drove into the library. I'm thinking three or four years, part-time job. What are the chances? I just felt like I should go in there. And so I walked in. I just said, uh, Becky Olson work here still? Yeah, she's here right now back in the AV department. It's like, okay. So you know what? Maybe you're single and you would like to be married. You trust the Lord with that. His timing won't be yours. It already hasn't been probably. But, but he'll be faithful. Out of the blue, he can put somebody back into your life that you never even thought had anything to do. If it's the right time and the right... God, more than I expected that day. Hey, listen, I've got a whole list of... I won't go through all the... I've got a whole list of things where God did way more than I expected. When I wrote to Pastor Chuck and said, hey, here's who I am, I've been coming, you know, since the 10 days, and you don't really know me, I met you a couple times, but I understand if you don't remember me, but I, you know, I really feel like the Lord, you know, might be putting on my heart to start a church, and, and uh, we need a Calvary Chapel up here in North Orange County, the others that used to be here are all gone, and, and we have a bunch in South County, but nothing up here right now, and, and uh, anyway, I didn't know, I just wrote him a letter. I didn't even know if he'd read it. And probably have some staff person read it and politely say, thank you so much for your interest in Calvary Chapel East Anaheim. Something, you know, kind of a template, kind of thing. Soon you'll be racing down the Matterhorn Mountain. Keep your arms in You know, something that they just sent out. Make copies of. Did I expect Chuck was going to write me back saying, we'd love to have you start a church. Welcome to the family. It's like, what? Is this really Chuck? Or is this somebody else? That easy? How could that be? Has God ever done more than you expected? I'll bet he has. Well, I suggest you make a list. More than that, not just for you. Not just so you remember it. It's fun to do that. But so you can tell somebody. In particular, your children. And if you're blessed. How many of you have grandchildren? Yeah, those ones. Have you told them your God stories? Have you told them what God's done that you didn't expect? Have you been impressed in front of them with Telling them the past of what God has done? Because that's exactly what God is saying, I want you guys to do. And by the way, this isn't the only time this happens in Scripture. It happens over and over and over again. 
what God, how God tells his people to celebrate the Passover. For 4,000 years now, every year, I want you guys to sit down. You're going to have an, you know, they have an empty chair. That's more of their tradition. But God said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to eat this stuff, and it's going to be, ugh, yuck. So your kids go, wow, we eat these bitter. What's with that? Well, good, I'm glad you asked. Because life was really bitter for our forefathers who were enslaved in Egypt. That's to remind us how bitter it was. It, I, we don't like it either. In other words, God is saying, I want to give you props. I want to give you ways. I want to require of you annually to talk about what I did in your past. So your kids grow up knowing the story. They can tell the story. You know, I used to tell at Christmas my little boys the story of, of Christmas. And we had a little manger scene. And I would tell this little, you know, I did my own version but I mean, I had the shepherds, you know, and I had Mary and Joseph, and we put Jesus in the little manger on Christmas. He wasn't there until Christmas Eve, which is, you know, we all know when Jesus was really born. But anyway, I, I would tell the story of, of the angel appearing to, to Mary and appearing to, to Joseph, and my kids would sit there and listen. And then there came a point where it was like, I want to, Daddy, I want to tell the story this year. I, 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 yeah, that's what I want too, you see. Uh, God wants you and me to find reasons to talk to our kids about what he has done. Now, you might say, well, Bob, that's great, but my kids are adults now, and, or uh, my kids aren't in the house anymore, or maybe you're here and you're saying, well, I, I, I never really told them all those things, but, but my kids don't really believe and walk with the Lord. You know, I don't see any asterisk in my Bible in verse 2 that says, only tell your kids if they're young and still uh, at home and are believers. I just don't see it. If you have one like that, please come up afterwards so I can cross it out in your Bible. Because that's not, <laughs> that's not what my Bible says at all. Uh, one of the mistakes we can make is to never tell our kids or our grandkids our testimony, never tell them the miracles God has done. Maybe we, we've forgotten or just, it's kind of like, yeah, if somebody asks me, I'll tell them. But I was thinking, my, my grandkids live at my house. And I've realized, oh, I've never told them half these things. I need to tell them. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them my list. I'm gonna go through it with them and they're gonna enjoy it. You know, my kids like hearing stuff about me. It's ridiculous. No, I mean it. And, and your kids will like hearing things about you. I don't know why. I, I cut my finger almost in half years ago when I was making a playhouse in my backyard. Both my sons when they were little and now my grandkids look at my finger and go, what happened to your finger? I go, you did, I've told you that 10 times. Tell me again. Now, I don't know if it's just like we like this <laughs> bloody story or what it is, but they want to hear that story. Anything that happened to me, they're interested in. Man, your kids, your grandkids will listen to you as you tell them uh, what God has done. And of course, the idea isn't just so they can go, wow, God moved in your life. I, it's so that they will realize that God wants to move in their life. Who founded the Salvation Army? Anybody know? What was the last name? Yeah, his first name was William Booth. William Booth incredible story of how God used him. I won't tell his story, but uh, he impacted the world for Christ in a way few people ever have. Um, when he died, 40,000 people attended his funeral, including the Queen of England. I mean, it was unbelievable. When they finished the funeral service and they took his body on its processional to where it would be buried, the guy that was cleaning up, and uh, they call him a sexton, we'd probably call him a custodian, the person cleaning up the church there in England uh, saw one guy was still uh, there. It was a, a, actually a Methodist pastor. And he looked in and he was, he was kneeling down uh, kind of at, this, at the altar and he overheard him. He was crying and he was praying. And he just kept repeating this over and over again. Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. See, God doesn't just want to do things so we go, wow, he used to be amazing and he used to do great things. He wants us to be excited about what God might yet do. We should never be so excited about what he did that we think that we wish we could go back. That's not what God wants. We should never forget what he did, but it should stimulate us to say just that. 
Oh, what God wants to do right now. What is God doing right now, you see? Because God is the God who says, I am. We'll put this down. Answer these two profound questions in our text. There are two of them. I want you to see the first one is in verse 3. In verse 3, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews. Here's the question. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? How long? So put it down. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? That's the first question that I think is not just for Pharaoh. It's for me. And it's, it's for you. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Pride, somebody has called pride the only disease that makes everyone else sick but the person who has it. Billy Graham said, we have in God we trust on our coins and me first engraved on our hearts. That attitude that says, I can handle my own problems, I can solve my own mysteries, I'll run my own world. Pride is the idolatrous worship of self and that is the national religion of hell. The Bible says God is opposed to the proud but he gives grace to the humble. But when I read that, I have to ask the question, Lord, are you against me? Like I was saying that woman who was in critical condition and didn't know it, Moses was willing to go on the mission of God, accept the mission of God, and then he found that God was opposing him on the way and was there to kill him because of his compromise. He thought he could just keep, wasn't that big a deal. His son wasn't circumcised. Oh, well, you know, no one's perfect, right? <laughs> Only human. My wife doesn't want me to do it, and I, you know, love my wife, so. Little compromises that we think are no big deal, and yet they're a big deal to God. It's easy to get into that place where, you know, here we have Jacob. We've already studied him in Genesis, and he's on his way, and he's all worried about Esau coming with his men. We're dead if he gets us. We're going to split it up. We're going to figure this out. He's never going to attack, attack one group. The other group will get away. I'm still kind of doing my, you know, figuring out my battleship plan, you know, my strategio. And then a man wrestles with him in the middle of the night when he's all alone. And he's fighting for his life. And you know the story. At some point he realizes, this isn't my enemy. This is God. This is the angel of the Lord. What am I doing fighting the person who loves me the most? What am I doing fighting the person who's been the only friend I've really ever had? What am I doing fighting you, Lord? What did Gamaliel say to the Sanhedrin? who were against the apostles. Take heed what you do with these men. If what they're preaching and doing is of men, if you give the pun, it'll peter out. But it's of God, if it's of God, you may be found to be fighting against God. That's a, that's a sad day when we wake up and realize I've been fighting the Lord. But it's an important day. So God says to Pharaoh, how long? How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Because ultimately God will humble Pharaoh. He'll bring him down. It'll cost the death of his firstborn son to get him there. God has ways to humble us that we don't have to have. You know, I, as a cop, you, we used to say to people, there's the easy way and there's the hard way. I mean, we're going to take you to jail. I may not be able to get you there myself, but... I've got a radio, and I, I have some people twice my size that'll be happy to help me hurt you, if necessary. I'm not trying to be boastful. I just, you're going to go to jail. Do you want to go to the hospital on the way, or do you just want to go to jail? <laughs> there's an easy way, and there's a hard way. And a lot of us feel like, no, I'm not going to do what God says. I'm... And God's saying, how long will you refuse to humble yourself. Well, put this down. How long? This is the second question. It's found in verse 7. How long will you let sin destroy everything? Look at verse 7. Pharaoh's servants said to Pharaoh, how long will this man, Moses, be a snare to us? Let the men 
Go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize Egypt is, <laughs> look around. It's gone, it's, the hail is destroyed. I mean, really? You want more? This amazes me. In scripture, here we have unbelievers encouraging Pharaoh to obey God. I mean, really? It's not just Moses and Aaron. Or, you know, they're telling him what God says. And all. I mean, these are, these are not believers. They're going, man, just do it. <laughs> things, are, things are so bad. I, I think it's kind of like this guy was in prison for years, and he heard the gospel, and he didn't want to receive the Lord. And this thought came to him, or the guy that was witnessing, I can't remember, was, spoke to him, and he said, you've tried everything else. Crime and drugs. You, you tried everything else but Jesus. How's that worked out for you? But you've never really bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. And it was like that, that. That was the logic it took. How long do you want to keep on going down this road? You, you can keep going and there's just more destruction ahead. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? And for some of us in this room tonight, that's exactly the question he's asking. God's saying, I love you. I want to do so much more. But you make me oppose you. How long? How much more destruction must there be? Put this down, letter C. A hard heart invites an escalation of destruction. Look at verse 4 through 6. He says, for if you refuse, God says, to let my people go, behold, tomorrow. By the way, when I read that, I hear God saying, we don't have to wait till tomorrow. You can repent tonight. There's judgment on the horizon. It's, uh, it, I've checked the forecast. Not good. It doesn't have to end this way, but just so you know, you have time to decide. It's I'll bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They'll also eat the rest of what has escaped from the hail. They'll eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Your houses will be full of locusts. Your servants' houses. Something which nobody has ever seen before. Um, we don't have locusts. We have earthquakes, right? The locusts aren't something man, all this technology has been able to solve. Just go Google tonight. Locust swarms right now all over Africa. Some of the worst, in fact, right now in Somalia, worse than 70 years. Horrible. People, places that are devastated to feed the, their people anyway. And there's nothing, they, 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 try to, they can try to treat it, but it's almost impossible for man at this point in our technology to really stop them. We have a picture of, uh, this is what a locust swarm, in fact, that's a current one. Now, just so you know, many of you maybe know this, but locusts are basically grasshoppers gone wild. Okay, literally. Um, there's a slide that shows you the difference between a locust and a grasshopper. Uh, the one on the right is your basic grasshopper. The one on the left is a locust, and they actually are the same insect. It changes under certain conditions, and, and we'll get back to that tonight, but it's, to me it's very interesting as it's portrayed here as a judgment of God because of the sin of unbelief, the sin of rebellion against God. God is bringing this insect by the way, this would have been a judgment against one of their gods, the goddess, really. Her name was Isis. <laughs> it just happens to be. Isis was the daughter of Nut, actually. I'm, it's the way it is. And, and the father was Geb, but um, Nut and Isis were the goddess who oversaw the sky and, and the weather. And... and uh, Brought healing and resurrection, supposedly. And, you know, here the hail had just destroyed the land, and, and that all came from the sky. So ISIS was not doing their job, and now things are just going to get worse than 
so that's obviously one of God's judgments on, the, on their God. Um, interesting what it says. These locusts, kind of a picture of sin in a way, going to come in and invade, multiply, going to cover the land. It's going to conceal the land. We have a picture of a, a guy in the midst of a, how would you like that experience? Um, and it's going to consume, just like sin does. It multiplies in someone's life. It takes over. It, it occupies every inch of their life into their home. Jot down Jeremiah 2.19. There's a principle in God's word that I love. It says, your own wickedness will correct you. And your apostasies will reprove you. Know, therefore, and see. It's evil. It's bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. And the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. In other words, hey, God said, you know, really, you're going to do things that are wrong, and you're going to have consequences, and it's going to be miserable. And you're going to be sitting there saying, why didn't I, why did I do that? Why didn't I stop? Why didn't I, you know, and you're going to have a lot of regrets. And in a way, this locust plague, which God had warned them about, uh, they would come to that conclusion. That's the way sin really is. Um, but put in this now in the next letter D, distill God's principles and believe God's promises. In verse 8, we have an interesting statement I want you to see. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, who are the ones that are going. Now it's interesting. Remember his, his sorcerers, his magicians, his advisors are saying, Hey, our land's a mess. You know, what's it going to take? And so he goes, oh, all right. So he, he calls him back. You know, got some advice from these guys that I, you know, should let you go. We don't really need any more problems on my watch. And uh, so he says, all right, you guys want to go three days journey to, you know, into the wilderness to, to sacrifice to the Lord. Go. Remember, we, he's already tried to compromise with them in the previous chapter. He said, go, but stay in the land. Remember that? Go ahead, but just don't. Don't leave the land. And they said, no, we can't do that. If we sacrifice these animals, the Egyptians will kill us. You know, we're going to be sacrificing some of their gods. That won't go well. And so he says, okay, well, you can go. Just don't go too far. Go right to the border. But that's as far as, and we saw these, these calls to compromise the worship with the Lord. Pharaoh's a type of the devil. But here he, notice the compromise. Go serve the Lord your God. But then he says, Who, who's going to go? Moses said, everybody, uh, we're going with our young and our old, our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds and our dogs and our cats. Okay, well, he's just saying every, every, everything we have, and we're, 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 the whole, everybody, we're taking our families. And he says, no, you're not doing that. There's no way you're taking the kids. You don't need the kids to go. Uh, put this down, never compromise on your kids. Pharaoh is saying, I'm going to hold the next generation hostage. You're not, you're not. I'm going to hold on to you by controlling them. <laughs> um, you know, it's been said a mother is only doing as well as her child who's doing the worst. You have nine kids that are doing great. If you have one that's not doing well, if you're a parent, but certainly a mom, your heart's breaking for that one. And I know it's true. Satan wants to have hold of your kids. And he wants you to give him control of your kids. Um, we can do that by leaving them behind spiritually. As believers, we need a policy, no child left behind. When it comes to the jurisdiction of the enemy. Um, remember what Joshua said? He said, as for me and my house, well, what? serve the Lord. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. When he said my house, he's talking about his family, right? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Well, I wonder how old his kids were. We don't know. But we do know how old he was. 110. He died right after that. Which suggests to me they probably weren't in preschool. So what's your point? It's interesting. He has fully adult children, and he is making a declaration about himself, his wife, and everybody that he has any 
relationship to biologically. As for me and my family, this is who we are, this is what we're doing. They didn't say, as for me and my wife, the missus, as far as the other adult kids, you'll have to ask them. Oh, no, no. He's going on record. This is who I am, and it's where we're going. Pastor Chuck was in his commentary talking about our kids and and about ministry. I like what he said. I want to read it to you. He said, for years, it has been a, a fear He said something else. <laughs> he said that too, but I'm not, that's a different thing. He said, quote, if you want to sacrifice and serve the Lord, that's one thing. This is Pharaoh. But don't force this on your children. If you want to make a total commitment to Jesus Christ, that's fine. But don't force your kids to be different. You know, go ahead. Let them listen to the music. Don't deprive them. Don't make them oddballs among their friends. Let them go to the movies. Let them see the videos. Don't make them be discriminated against by their peers because they want to serve the Lord or because they have to go to church. That was his kind of application of this, that Satan comes and says, hey, you can go ahead and go full on for the Lord. Leave your kids with me. And that's the deal that a lot of Christian parents make. Well, you know, they're young. They'll get serious about the Lord later. I wasn't serious about the Lord at their age, so... You, we neglect that command of God, bring your children up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And we actually abdicate the role without intending to, to the enemy. Put this down. See God moves in a supernaturally natural way. Put in the word natural. Look at verse 12 through 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may want, come on the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all the hail has left. So he stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, east wind brought the locusts. Um, we serve a God of miracles. There's no question about it. We need to remember that. Sometimes I think when people pray for the sick, they forget that God can heal miraculously. Um, Jesus didn't say, these signs shall accompany those who believe. You'll lay hands on the sick and they'll have successful operations. He didn't say that. He said, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll, they'll be healed. He said, if you're sick, call for the elders. They'll anoint them with oil. They'll pray over them and they'll be raised up. It's not that God doesn't heal through other means. It's just we should remember God is a it's Jehovah Rapha who can physically heal just as when Jesus was here and that's the one we should ask. Well, I think sometimes we come with a lot of unbelief. We pray for a, a successful surgery. Nothing wrong with that, but it's like that's not what he commanded us to do. Having said that, we make a grave mistake of thinking that that's the only way that he heals is miraculously. That's just not true Either. We, we fall off the boat on both sides. You know, when Peter was in prison, the church prayed and God sent an angel to break people, uh, people break P- Peter out of prison. And uh, that was a miracle. When Paul later was in prison, in jail, really in custody in the Antonio Fortress, uh, he was saved from being killed, but not by a miracle, but by being someone's uncle. His nephew overheard a plot to kill him and came and told Paul, and Paul said, go tell the commander. There was nothing miraculous about that other than his nephew being in the right place at the right time. And Paul got saved by the Lord through those circumstances. God can use miracles, and God can use natural circumstances. We need to not miss God in the natural. I think too often we do. Remember Elijah was told by God, come out, I want to talk to you out at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. Went out to the cave and uh, the Bible says that God allowed a wind to come by, a powerful wind that broke rocks. That's a wind. I thought it was windy the other day, but I mean this was a wind that's breaking rocks. Then he had a fire They came through. He was in the cave and it was just burning through. God wasn't in the fire, wasn't in the wind. Was it an earthquake? God quite often, all through the Bible, there's earthquakes in God's presence. 
up on Mount Sinai, the earth was shaking, Jesus rose from the dead, there was an earthquake. Earthquakes are related to God's presence all through the Bible. But he wasn't in the earthquake. I think every time Elijah's going, that's the Lord. That, no, no, that's the Lord. There's the shake and bake, he's here. <laughs> no. And how did God manifest his presence to Elijah? A still small voice, a gentle wind, it depends on the translation, quite natural. Wasn't looking for it in that. Sometimes we, that's why the Bible says, cease striving and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. That doesn't have to do a miracle. Sometimes us are looking for a miracle to know that it's God. And God's saying, hello. <laughs> we just talk. I almost died when I was 18 because my appendix had ruptured. And um, my appendix, um, which most of us don't think about, I didn't think about mine until it made me think about it, but um, my appendix had uh, ruptured for 10 days and had been putting poison into my body. And um, so because of where my appendix grew, it, it didn't grow where it was supposed to. It didn't grow up off my elbow, but it grew on the wrong side of my colon. So my symptoms were not typical. And uh, they couldn't even tell me that it was something wrong with my appendix when I went into the emergency room. They just said, we're not sure, but we'd like to cut. I thought, <laughs> if we want to do exploratory surgery. I'm thinking, sounds like Fantastic Voyage. You're going in to look around, you know. <laughs> if you know what Fantastic Voyage is, I'm sorry. You've been around this earth a long time. <laughs> By the way, go back and watch that again. That is the hokiest. It was amazing when we were younger. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> And they went in, and sure enough, the, the surgeon later told me I almost died. I was, in the, I was the picture of health at that point. I was 18. I was in good shape. I almost died. He said, I've never seen anybody so sick as you are. I almost lost you on the table. He said, the only thing that, that saved you was the fact that you were on these antibiotics, having nothing to do with the appendectomy or the appendicitis. I had been on them for years. They were doing nothing for the condition I was taking them in, but I kept taking them because I was told I should take them. Had I not been on those antibiotics, I'd have been dead. See, God's taking care of you when you're not aware of it. So, every once in a while, he lets you be aware of it. It's like, oh, God did this. And the angels are going, well, would you, can we tell them about the other 50 times this week that I saved their life? Yeah, when they get to heaven, you know. Well, my point in all that is, is that God uses natural means all the time to minister to us. And uh, what we see here with this in invasion of the locust is this destruction of the land. And you might say, in a sense, that's what happens in a person's life where sin goes unchecked and it multiplies. If you really want to know, in all of history the result of, the effects of, the picture of what sin does. Where do you look? The Cal you go to Calvary. That's what sin does. God made him who knew no sin to be sin. And so he is crucified. He is stripped bare, dying in shame and public humiliation, mocked, alone, abandoned by God and man, beaten, whipped, that's what sin does. That's where it'll take you. It devastates you. And that's what's happened to the land of Egypt, you see, through these locusts. Well, put this down. Repentance is only measured in change, not in words. Verse 16, then Pharaoh, when he saw this destruction, he calls for Moses and Aaron. He says the words, I have sinned. Those are good words. They're just not enough. I have sinned against the Lord and he feels like he's offended them so and I've sinned against you now therefore please forgive my sin wow that's pretty cool only, only this once I and mean, that sounds like kind of like everything else wasn't so bad but this, this time I'm anyway and sup, you know intercede to the Lord make supplication that he would only remove this death from me and, and they do you know, if you go down to Theo Lacey or, or Chino State Prison and you were to go cell block by cell block and ask the people who are in prison this question, are you sorry? Are you sorry for what's happened in your life? 
most of them would say, yes, I am sorry. But if you would dig a little deeper, you would find them saying, because I got caught? Or I'm sorry I trusted that lawyer? Or my pant, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not what you think it is, you see. I'm sorry for the consequences that what I did, what happened to me. Pharaoh's confession sounds good, but it is defective. We know it because it only lasts until the locusts leave. Repentance may well include sorrow. It doesn't always, by the way. It may well, and it ought to include sorrow and words, acknowledging your sin. But confession of sin, sorrow are not repentance. Let me say that again. Saying I have sinned and feeling bad about it is not repentance. Ambrose said to repent is to cease the sin. Until there's a change of behavior, there is no repentance. And he doesn't repent. So we ought to be careful with ourselves and thinking because we got caught or because we got in trouble or we're really sorry these circumstances have happened and God, God, I'm so sorry I've sinned. Well, that doesn't prove you are really repentant. Your life. I've seen people who didn't feel that bad but they changed their life. And people who felt terrible and emotional and oh my goodness, oh wow. And then they went right back to it. You can't know always. Well, they got caught. How will we know if they really repented? It's really obvious. Do they continue the sin? Not about whether they got caught, you see. David got caught. He really repented. Saul gets caught and it's all words. Put this down. See, God can exterminate what's bugging you for good. In verse 19, so the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts, drove them into the Red Sea. Notice this phrase, and not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. Why is that interesting to me? God's going to take these locusts, and he's going to drive them into the sea, and not one's going to be left. Folks, this is a preview of coming attractions. Exodus 14 and verse 13. But Moses said to the people, don't fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Jot down Exodus 14, 27 and 28. So Moses stretched out his hand, sound familiar? Over the sea, the Red Sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. And then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The water returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. What is that next phrase? Oh, not even one remained. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, what's happening with these locusts is going to happen with the armies of Pharaoh. Finally, put these down for our kind of next steps tonight. Believe what sin has devoured, God can and will restore. The book of Joel describes judgments that God brought on the southern kingdom of Judah because of their sin and their apostasy and their idolatry. Wave after wave of locusts, actual locust plague later in their history. Because of their sin, God brought it on his own people. This is interesting. Then he says, this is Joel 2 and verse 25 to his people that were devastated by the locusts. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. God says, I sent them, and I sent them because of your sin, but I want you to know when you get right with me, I can restore all that sin has taken away from you. Some of us here tonight would look and say, man, sin has ripped me off of my marriage, of my kids. Sin has ripped me off of what could have been, what used to be, what should have been, and God is saying to you tonight, listen, I brought judgment, and sin brought judgment into your life, but if you'll get right with me, I can give you back. I will restore to you what was taken away from you because of your disobedience. That's a great word of promise and hope. And then put this down. See that God's power comes through community. I want you to jot down Proverbs 30 and verse 27. I think there's a lesson for us in the locusts that I don't want to miss. Here's what it says. The locusts have no king, 
yet all of them go out in ranks. This is where Solomon is talking about there are small animals uh, that are small, but they're very wise. And one of them he points out to is the locust. Um, interesting. I want you to see that while God brings a judgment of locusts, he calls it his army, and Joel, it's obviously being used by him to bring about punishment, to bring glory to himself. But there's another lesson for us in, in the locust, in the actual animal itself. Um, first, we need to understand something about the grasshopper. So the grasshopper, by nature, is, um, first of all, it is um, either green or brown, and um, it, it is... Uh, camouflaged, meaning it, it wants to fit in and not be a pro it doesn't want to be eaten. So the grasshopper by itself is um, solitary. They don't like other grasshoppers. They, they hang out and hide in the bushes, and they just kind of, they're low lives, basically. They, they don't really have much in the, they don't hang out with other grasshoppers, and they, they just kind of live their little life away. What happens is something amazing when they're is not enough food, and grasshoppers have to be in one location. These desert locusts, or what are called desert locusts, are grasshoppers, and because of a chemical change in their brain, it's actually serotonin, something happens when they rub up against each other, they become what's called gregarious. That's what they call it. They, they, they get excited, and a biological transformation happens to them. They, they give up their camo for very vibrant colors. They become very colorful they suddenly, instead of wanting to avoid each other, they want to be with each other. And they start swarming, their appetites grow, and they can start moving, they can move 100 miles in a day, and they are eating everything in sight, and they are moving out with each other. It's a complete, total transformation, so much so, it was only in the 20th century we discovered that a grasshopper and a locust, we thought up to that time were two different species. They're not, they're the same. They become a picture to us, I believe, of what God's intention is through community, of, of the power of God. I want you to jot down just a couple verses. I know it's past time. I'm watching. Um, <laughs> Acts 2, verses 1 and 2. Look at what happened. When the day of Pentecost had come and they were all what? Well, they were together. Suddenly there came a violent rushing wind that filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. When they're all together, jot down Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together, was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. The move of God's Spirit seems to be tied to the body of Christ coming together. And in a very real sense, you might say that God gives us a choice. You can, you know, we just by nature, even as Christians, I think sometimes we're solitary. We don't really have an interest in other people. We just kind of want to live our little life the way we want. We want to blend in. We just don't want to be noticed by anybody in the world, you know. What happens is when we are energized by the Spirit of God together. We don't care that we're noticeable. We don't mind. We don't, we don't care what the enemy thinks. We don't care. We're not trying to fit in anymore. Suddenly, God increases our appetite for the Word of God, for one. And secondly, for the mission that our invisible king, we have a king, you just can't see him, is sending us on. And we go out in ranks together to do something we can't even imagine we would ever be part of. And it's kind of like this locust is, what did Jesus say? He said, I'm going to build my church, or I'm going to build upon this rock my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. He pictures his bride as an unstoppable army. That's exactly what God calls locust storms in Joel 1. They're an army. You're not going to be able to stop them. In other words, God wants to do things through us together that we'll never know, understand, or want to be part of until his spirit energizes us together. When that happens, suddenly, you know what? Locusts, they want to be together. They want to be, they're on mission. That's, in fact, do you know this? They call them swarmers. Once you're a locust, it is possible to go back to a grasshopper. But they don't usually. And if you're a swarmer, if you're a locust, guess what you reproduce? Swarmers. They don't give birth to little low-life grasshoppers. <laughs> what they reproduce are other swarmers. That's how it works. When you're a spirit-filled believer, you're going to produce other spirit-filled believers. Your children are going to see that God is alive in your life, that he's using you, and they're going to go, I want that. I choose that. 
That's, that's exactly right. You're going to feed that right into their lives. And I believe that the Lord would tell us, I want to use you guys in ways that are beyond anything you've ever expected. But it's going to happen together. My power will come in you, and you'll be on mission for the glory of God. Amen? Let's have the worship team come, and we'll close in song. Let's all stand. On behalf of our pastors and staff, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's video. If you want to stay informed about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and do so by clicking the button below. We'll see you next time.